His name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, as we come to your throne of grace and mercy this evening, Father, I just want to thank you for another breath in my lung, another opportunity to just speak your word this evening, to let it go out and not return void. Father, we are few in numbers, and so, Lord, I just lift up those that were not here this evening for whatever reason, whether it be sickness or other obligation. Father, I just lift them up in prayer. The devil is on his, on his prow again, seeking whom he may devour, and he's taken out a few people with the sickness bug. And so, Father, we pray to those people that they just get healthy again. Bring them back, bring them back, Lord, so they can continue to grow closer to you as the church body of believers. Help us lean on each other and stand strong and firm on the solid foundation of Jesus, our rock. Father, tonight I pray that your message that you've given to me, Father, I pray that you will just help me to get out of the way. Father, I do not deserve the opportunity to stand up here because I am a sinner. I have failed you day in and day out, but Father, you have given me the chance. Father, you have given me the opportunity to stand before these people and to speak your word, and so Lord, I thank you for that opportunity. Father, I pray you get me out of the way. Father, I pray that your word comes through me with power and authority. Anoint me from on high, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, Father. Let me just be a vessel for your word. Father, I pray your spirit fills this place, every nook, cranny, and crevice. Let your spirit speak to those hearts and minds. Remind them what the season is all about starting today as we get into the month of December all the way through until we celebrate the birth of your son. Father, let us each and every single day remember what it is he did for us. And let's start with the birth of your son. Lord, we look forward to what you have in store for us this evening. And as always, Lord, we ask you nothing but your will to be done. As it is in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, you may be seated. <clears throat> so, I'm sure that you can count on your fingers how many times you've read this one, right? Few, huh? <laughs> but yeah, it was, it's just one of those things. That you guys know me. You know, one of my favorite numbers is the number eight. And so anytime I see the number eight in Scripture, I kind of, you know, skip a beat. You know, I kind of hit a speed bump. And so when I saw that eight days were completed, Jesus were circumcised, I had to stop there and I had to look and see what's going on. I had to understand, why eight days? What is so significant of eight days? And then after I started asking that question, the next question that I had for myself was, why, why did she have to take the child to the sanctuary to sanctify him, to consecrate him to the Lord? What were all of the reasons why this all occurred? Simple four verses, but what was the reason? The law of Moses, the law of the Lord, what were all of these things? And you'll notice... There was a word in there that really caught my attention that I put a little circle around, and that is the word of purification. I believe it's in, um, let's see here, verse 22, the days of her purification according to the law of Moses. So that stopped me. See, when you read the word, if you don't understand something, you just don't keep going. You stop. You write it down. You say, I want to come back to that. I want to go look and see what that means. And so that's what happened here. I didn't know what that meant. So... I'm going to feed you, baby birds. Let's find out what this all means. So we're going to start, if you would with me, let's turn to Leviticus chapter 12. Leviticus chapter 12. Keep your place there in Luke. We don't want to lose that. But we want to turn back over to Leviticus chapter 12. And if you would, yep, thank you very, Ron. I appreciate that. So Leviticus chapter 12, we're going to read verses 1 to 8. Everybody with me? Give me an amen. All right, all right. Waiting on one more. Thank you. All right, Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Read along with me. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue... In the blood of her purification, 33 days, 
She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her customary impurity. And she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. And she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who has born a male or female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One as a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she will be clean. Now, did anybody kind of get a little shocked by that? I did. When she births a child, she is unclean for seven days. That was a bit of a shock to me. For seven days, she is unclean. She's not allowed to touch anything holy. On the eighth day, they circumcise the baby and they give the name. And then after that, if she bears a male child, Scripture teaches us that she is unclean for 33 additional days. However, if she bears a female child, she's unclean for a total of 80 days. Anybody else shocked by that? I was. What is it? Why? The question that I had was, how long is a woman considered unclean, and why does the gender of the child, why is that significant? What is it about a male child versus a female child? Well, I'll feed you baby birds. Thanks for asking the question. So, scholars differ. So who you ask differs. There is no scriptural evidence that points directly to the answer of this question. It's one of those cultural things. However, scholars have talked about it. There are a couple of them here that are completely crazy, but I'm going to share them with you just to get your thoughts and also get a reaction of like, oh, you're kidding me. But then I'll give you what I think based upon the research that I've done. So the first one here, scholars believe the reason why is because back in that culture, they believed that when a woman birthed a male, she did not bleed from the birth, but when she birthed a female, she bled longer. A menstruation occurred. So she was actually continuing to bleed for up to 80 days when she birthed a female child versus when she birthed a male child. I don't know about you. That sounds crazy. Again, hormones, possibility. Possibility. Hormones, that was also, could be because males are normally bigger than females. Maybe there's a lot more blood flow that happens after the birth. Who knows? Again, not quite sure on that one. So believe that one if you want to. I'm going to move on. The second one, this one's eerie, is that they suggest that because the woman defied God in Genesis, she tricked her husband so the punishment for her uncleanliness was twice as long if she birthed a female. That sounds stupid. Anybody else agree with me on that one? That she... <laughs> She's being punished for birthing a female versus a male. Again, no scriptural evidence to back it up. However, some scholars do believe that it's a punishment. Hmm? Cultural, yeah, that's a possibility. Again, the Bible, see, that's one of the things that we've all tried to learn about here recently is the Bible was written, they know more about it than we do today because they understood it. So maybe this is something that they understood and we don't. Scholars just don't have the evidence. Here's one that really blows your mind. Anybody ever heard of the Apocrypha? Okay. So there's a book in the Apocrypha. For those who don't know, the Apocrypha is an additional set of books that the Catholics use. They actually keep it in their Bible. And in those books, they are a testament of other stories that happened during, that occurred during the biblical time. The Hebrew Bible but does not include these as canon to Scripture. So they are not included in our Bible. However they still can be read as stories because they did give an account. They did give a historical account of what happened during that time. But when you read the Apocrypha, since we're Christians and not Catholics, 
read it as if it's telling a story, not that it's scriptural evidence from the Holy Word. Okay? So in the Apocrypha, it is believed that Adam was actually created after the first week of creation, and Eve was not created until the second week of creation. So because the seven days and the 14 days, she is unclean for birthing a male child for seven days because Adam was created after seven days, and then she was unclean for a female child because Eve was created the second week. Again, that's from the Apocrypha, and what do we do? We read it as a story, but we don't take it as scriptural evidence from the Holy Word. So those are three that I found, again, multiple other evidence that scholars have given on why the significance of 7 to 14 and 40 to 80. I'm going to give you what I believe. The longer period of ceremonial uncleanness for the birth of a daughter, it should not be considered a penalty. It is not a punishment. It is linked to an idea stated of impurity, a symbolic responsibility of bringing other sinners into the world. So stay with me on this. When you birth a child, you are bringing sin into the world. Because since the fall of man, we're all sinful. Amen? So a child being born is more sin being brought into the world. And so for the punishment of a male child is only seven days because a male child cannot bring more sin into the world, but a female child can. So think about that. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? It has also been suggested that this period of time has a connection with the birth of a girl because girls are usually smaller at birth. And so because of that, that would allow more time for the mother to focus care and attention on the child. Since sons were more prized, longer time for home, for a mother with a newborn girl would force the family to bond more deeply over an extended period of time with a girl. Remember, in this time frame, a girl did not stick around for very long. As soon as she was able to be bred off and, and married, she was gone. So they would stay with her a lot longer to develop that bonding time. Again, no scriptural evidence as to why 7 or 14 days, 40 or 80 days. Just an interesting thought. However, there is an interesting tie to the life of Jesus that I want to talk about. Matthew chapter 21. Does anybody remember the triumphal entry? Okay. So this is the, the time frame, Palm Sunday, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a fowl or a colt, right? Everybody with me? Okay. This day happens to be the 10th day of Nisan, which is a month in the Hebrew calendar. The 10th day of the month is known as Lamb Selection Day. Anybody remember the Passover? Okay. The, it, Lamb Selection Day was always done on the 10th day of the month of Nisan so that they would choose the lamb for the Passover. And it just so happened that Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, was the 10th day of Nisan. Israel, without even knowing it, chose their Passover lamb as he entered Jerusalem. Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus was chosen by Israel as the Passover lamb on the triumphal entry. If you start counting... From the triumphal entry is day one. You've got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday's what? Mo Monday, Thursday. That's when the disciples had their meal. Friday, Good Friday. That's what happened that day. Crucifixion. Saturday, that's the Sabbath. Everybody rested. Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is what? It's the eighth day. Resurrection Sunday falls on the eighth day. Put a pin in that. I got ahead of myself. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. 
tying Exodus chapter 12 to Matthew chapter 21, we can see that Jesus riding in was the selection. So there's your scriptural evidence to tie. The 10th of Nisan, the 10th of that month, was the same day that the triumphal entry occurred. The Israelites, without even knowing it, shouting to him, Hosanna, Hosanna, declared him the worthiest of all lambs, without blemish or defect, ready to take away the sins of the world. So Exodus chapter 12 was fulfilled with Matthew chapter 21, the triumphal entry. So now, going back to our count. So if we count eight days, that means on the day that the child would have been circumcised, the eighth day, Jesus res resurrected on Resurrection Sunday. How does this all tie together? Think about it. Jesus was circumcised from his natural flesh to his spiritual perfect body on the eighth day. Let that sink in. When he rode in, Israel selected him as the Passover lamb. And for seven days, Israel plotted to kill him. For seven days, they were unclean. Just like the birth of a child and a mother giving birth. For seven days, Israel was unclean. And on the eighth day, when he resurrected, he was circumcised from his natural flesh and into his perfect body. Isn't that cool? So we know that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection fulfilled the requirement from Exodus chapter 12 and Leviticus chapter 12. Now, let me ask you this question. After Jesus' resurrection, how many days was he on this earth? Acts chapter 1 verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, he was on this earth for 40 days, fulfilling the exact same scripture in Leviticus chapter 12 for an unclean mother. Israel was unclean because of what they had done for 33 more days. And it required Jesus' ascension to God the Father for the purification of Israel to meet the requirement. Ain't that awesome? That's chilly, folks. The death, burial, and resurrection, did you know, ties directly to the law of Moses and the cleanliness of a mother giving birth to a child. Jesus' resurrection and his ascension made Israel pure. Not empty of sin. Don't lose sight. There was still sin occurring. But Jesus' ascension purified them like the mother. They were considered clean. Now, if Jesus were born a female, maybe it would have lasted for 80 days because that would have fulfilled the scripture. But because he was born a male, the requirement was 40 days. The entire life and death are proof that Jesus fulfilled the law again. In the story, Israel was the mother requiring the purification process to conclude before being able to worship God again. Now, flip back with me to Luke chapter 2. So we can see in the text here in verses 21 and 22 where it says, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the, cry, of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. They fulfilled the law of Moses from Leviticus chapter 12 by waiting eight days before circumcising Jesus. And then after that, they had to wait an additional 33 days. Why? Because the law of Moses required it and because the child was born a male. So that meant 33 days she had to wait. She could touch nothing holy. She could not go to the sanctuary. She could not worship for 33 days. Some of you may be like, well, hey, that's a vacation. I'll take it. Being away from your Lord, probably terrifying. But it was necessary for ladies, for them to heal 
for them to be given freedom from their duties so they didn't have to cook or clean or do house waters and, and the things that ladies did back in this ancient time. They didn't have to do those. They were given time to heal. They were given an opportunity. So we get to verse 22. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Again, the purification process. They had to wait 33 days before they could even take Jesus to the sanctuary. So how many days old was Jesus when he got to go to be consecrated to the Lord? He was 40 days old. Depending plus or minus the travel time, of course. But now we know what verse 22 truly means. It means that she had to wait to be pure before she could even take Jesus to the scripture, to the temple. So now we get to verse 23. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy. From what scripture is this from? If you want to write it down, you can read it later. I think we are going to have it up there as well. It's Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate me to all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast, it is mine. The firstborn child of every family, as far as the law of Moses was concerned, was the Lord's. They were to all. Every single one, whether male or female, be taken to the sanctuary to be given to God. Now, what have we been learning over Pastor Casey's past few messages? That the firstborn was what? The heir of the inheritance. Before they could even get the title, they had to go to the Lord first. No baby was allowed to be an heir to an inheritance if they were the firstborn child unless they were consecrated to the Lord. Jesus had to be taken because he was not only the firstborn male, but also the firstborn to open the womb of Mary. He had to be taken. God required it. He had to be sanctified to the Lord before he could even be recognized as the heir to the inheritance of Joseph. So, as it is written, every male who opens the womb shall be holy to the Lord. Jesus, Mary, his firstborn son, by doing this fulfilled Exodus chapter 13. Verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. Let's stop right there. To offer a sacrifice. So what does this mean? When you go to the Lord, when you bring your firstborn child to the sanctuary, you are to offer a sacrifice. Going back to Leviticus chapter 12, verses 6 and 8. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring the priest a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a bird, a turtle dove, or a pigeon for the sin offering. Remember this? So in order for her to be sanctified, in order to consecrate the child in the sanctuary of the Lord, they had to offer two animals for a sacrifice. They had to offer a burnt offering and a sin offering. The burnt offering was a lamb. The sin offering was a bird, whether it be a turtle dove or a young pigeon, either one. So again, comparing Luke chapter, 20, or chapter 2, verse 24, to Leviticus chapter 12, we can see that Jesus was consecrated with what? A burnt offering and a sin offering. In verse 8 of Leviticus chapter 12, she was not able to bring a lamb, she bring two turtle doves and two young pigeons. This is the sign and a showing that Jesus was born in humble, poor regard. Mary could not afford, Joseph could not afford a lamb. They were poor. Again, can you imagine how Jesus would have been if he was born into a rich family? Well, I know being Jesus, he would have still been as beautiful and as humble as possible, but the story would have meant completely different. Jesus was born poor. He was born humble. He lived a poor life. He lived a humble life. He had nothing but God the Father. Circling all back to what we've been talking about over these past few weeks, 
How many of us would truly be willing to give it all away and live like Jesus? Poor. Scripture teaches us straight right there. He was born into humble beginnings. And to fulfill the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought the burnt offering and the sin offering as two turtle doves just so Mary could be made clean through atonement for the burnt and sin offering. By doing this, she could be clean. God made provision for the poor just to come to him just as much as the rich. So, a lot of great information. Hopefully you learned something. But I guarantee you, One of you out there is asking the question, what does this mean to me? Because that's what it always happens. You know, we can't get up here and just share some amazing information that that excites us and and that we learn and we're like, hey, get this. Because you're like, okay, yeah, that's all great and good, but that's Old Testament stuff. What does this mean to me? I don't have to worry about offerings, right? What does this mean to me? Well, you don't have to wait seven or 14 days. Some, men, some women might like that. They might be like, hey, sign me up. We're in, don't bother me for 14 days. I just had a girl, right? Some would be okay with that. Some would be okay. Can I have 40, 80 days off of work? Some people don't approve it. You know, you get a hard-nosed boss who won't give him time off for birthing a baby. Sorry, I had something in my eye. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Some would like those kinds of things. But again, this is all Old Testament stuff. So what does this mean to you? Like, what do we have to do? Well, do you have to bring offerings to a priest? Do you have to atone for your sin? Do you have to remain unclean after the birth of a child? No. What does this mean to you? What have we learned this evening? Praise God. You don't have to do this anymore. Praise the Lord that you do not have to do this anymore. Because why? Because Jesus came to fulfill the law. He showed up, did what he had to do, and now the law of Moses is fulfilled in its entirety. You no longer have to bring an offering to the priest. Jesus was your offering for you. He was the last sacrifice that will ever be needed again. He did that for you. Not only did he take away your sins, but he also made you clean. He also paid for you. He also atoned for you. Jesus did it. He fulfilled the law and the prophecies of the prophets. He made the ultimate sacrifice. Have you thanked Jesus recently for what he did for you? No more do we have to require priests to offer sacrifices in our holy places. Jesus did it once and for all. By grace and faith, we are made right with God. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says this, And you, being dead in your trespass, yes, we're all sinners, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, has made alive altogether with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Praise God. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Jesus fulfilled every requirement that you were under from the law of Moses. That's another reason to praise him. Short message. But tonight, I think we need to come up here and I think we need to atone for some sin in our lives. I think we need to come forth and really and truly thank God for what he's done. I think we're missing a lot of gratitude in our lives. We say it, we spit it out, we blurt it. But what did we say earlier this morning? Actions speak louder than the words. So I'm going to ask the sound guys to put on a slow song for us. And if you truly know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've truly been transformed, if the blood of Christ covers you, then I want you to come up to this altar. I want you to atone. And I want you to be thankful. Thank him for what he's done. He took away your sin. He gave you a ticket. 
to be with God the Father when you've taken your last breath on this earth. He deserves our thanks. Do you agree? So then get out of your comfort zones. If you can't lean, if you can't get down on your knees, sit on the first pew. It's about getting out of where you're at now and coming forward. Making that choice to say, you know what, Jesus, thank you. You did it for me. And I'm willing to come up here and say thank you. And if you don't know Jesus, Father God, I pray now, if the Holy Spirit has been convicting you to say, you know what, I'm not sure about this, Jesus. I've been going to church my whole life. I said, said the prayers, I've said this, I've read the Bible. What will we learn this morning? Actions speak louder than words. Where are your actions? What have you done for Christ's kingdom? So if you don't know Jesus as you truly think you do, then I ask you to come up here. And I ask you to say, you know what, God? I've been pretending. I've been playing church and I need this Jesus. I need to know what this Jesus has in store for me. Make the choice and just see what he can do to transform your life. It's going to be hard. Nobody said it's easy. It's a relationship and it's a journey. Come forth. Join me up here as we thank God and praise him because he's alone worthy of it all. Ron, you got something for us? Give it a whirl. Super.